President Cyril Ramaphosa addressing the United Nations General Assembly right now on the summit of the future. Let's take you live to New York. Our time, climate change and public health challenges are not only an existential threat, but they are also reversing economic growth and developmental gains in many parts of the world. There is widespread inequality, poverty, unemployment, deprivation and destitution in many countries in the world. These challenges transcend borders. Through this summit of the future, we must therefore forge global consensus on how to implement the solutions that are embedded in the pact. This pact must bridge the developmental divide. It must provide practical solutions to the challenges of today and tomorrow. The Pact for the Future is a great opportunity to change and also to reinvigorate the multilateral system so that it is fit for purpose to address the challenges that the world faces. It is an opportunity also to make good on the promises to reform the global governance architecture, including the international finance institutions and the United Nations Security Council. Placing the fate of the world's security in the hands of a select few when it is the vast majority of the peoples of the world who bear the brunt of the various threats is unjust, unfair, and unsustainable. We agree with the UN Secretary General that the Summit of the Future is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to forge global consensus and make progress on priorities such as sustainable development goals. For African countries, the summit must focus on global action in support of the continent's development agenda, Agenda 2063. To be meaningful, this summit of the future should reinforce the work towards ending poverty and realizing the fundamental right of development. This summit, therefore, must accelerate our collective efforts to advance development. The key element of the summit is working towards an agenda for peace, and this must involve strengthening the multilateral actions that need to continue taking place. We do believe that this is the time to recommit ourselves to adopting concrete actions. So we should leave this summit with a more ambitious, clearer, and concrete call to action to build a world for future generation that is far better for young people and for women than the world that we live in today. Our failure will in the end be a betrayal for future generations. And I do believe that we dare not fail. Action is what is required now. Thank you very much. I thank the President of the Republic of South and it was President Soto Ramaphosa uh, expressing his opening remarks at the Summit of the Future at the United Nations General Assembly, the 79th edition of the United Nations General Assembly, emphasizing there what the summit must focus on, giving us an outline of some of the key priorities he believes should be in focus for the development of the continent. One, a focus on climate change, he says, that must be coupled with action, very specifically focusing on the most vulnerable parts of the continent. And the action he speaks of was previous, uh, con congruent to previous statements in relation to resource allocation to African countries uh, undergoing, African, uh, undergoing climate change effects on the African continent. Agenda 2063, which is Africa's development agenda uh, that the U Africa Union had put together. He emphasizes that that once again must be the focus of the summit. 
We now bring you Sherwin Bryce Peace, SBC International Correspondent, live from New York, joining us. Sherwin, good evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Really do appreciate it. It was a very short and brief opening remarks by the president over there, setting the tone for what he believes the summit should be focusing on. What are the chances that the agenda that President Ramaphosa had just outlined will rise to the top of the summit agenda? Well, that is the big question as to whether what member states have adopted here by consensus will uh, be implemented moving, moving forward. And I think what we've seen over the years in terms of pacts and declarations and political declarations that are adopted by similar summits uh, at the United Nations, they are not always implemented, most notably the SDG uh, 17 goals that were adopted in 2018, uh, where the targets uh, languish at around 17 percent implemented. That is a broad failure of the international community. And so what the pact of the future that was adopted by consensus by member states just before the president spoke there is essentially a reshaping and a restructuring of how multilateral institutions, most notably the United Nations, the Security Council, Bretton Woods institutions, essentially development uh, financial institutions, how these bodies, these multilateral formations uh, grapple with the very complex challenges that are facing the world today, be that the Sustainable Development Goals, be that climate change in particular, be that uh, the peace and security architecture that is supposed to be driven by what the UN Security Council decides. And often it is a UN Security Council that is unable to decide on, uh, on how to stop conflicts, be that the uh, most notable uh, uh, example of Gaza, the situation in Ukraine, which is becoming a long-standing intractable conflict, or what we have most recently seen uh, in terms of the civil conflict between two generals in Sudan. Uh, part of this document also includes what's known as a digital compact. The digital compact uh, looks specifically at what our future in terms of uh, digitalization looks like, right? We talk a lot about artificial intelligence, AI, a future of robotics. What are the guardrails, particularly for smaller countries, developing countries that do not have the means to be grappling with these very complex issues? What will this digital compact do for the smaller countries, but also, uh, you know, the, the, the movement that requires global consensus in, in terms of a digital future? It also included a declaration declaration uh, for future generations, a broad vision on what we must do now to ensure that future generations have a sustainable planet to live on. So President Ramaphosa, uh, they're of course calling it an opportunity to change and reinvigorate the multilateral system so that it is fit for the purpose of addressing the challenges the world faces today. He emphasized his very short remarks, as you well point out, on the need for UN Security Council reform. Of course, we have seen uh, countries like the United States come forward recently talking about the need, uh, their support for two permanent African seats, but notably without the veto. And what the Ezulwini consensus and the CERT declaration, which uh, informs the uh, Ezulwini consensus, has been very clear. The African common position asks for two permanent African seats. And if there is a decision to retain the veto in those intergovernmental negotiations, which are longstanding and ongoing, then that veto should be afforded to the new permanent members, including the two African seats. So that is a process that is yet to unfold. Uh, but to your question, whether this document will be implemented is the big question. It's, it's absolutely necessary for it to be implemented. But as member states have shown us, based on these voluntary consensus documents, they don't always meet the moment, do they? Yeah, let's look a little bit at the subtext of uh, some of those remarks, particularly pertaining to the Security Council. He says they're placing the fate of the world's security in the hands of a select few when it is the vast majority who bear the brunt uh, of the world's decisions is unjust, unfair and unsustainable. Of course, you spoke there to uh, whether or not African countries or at least Africa representation should have veto power uh, as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. But more importantly there, it's the elephant in the room and whether or not uh, the sanctions which the United Nations Nations Security Council, which the United Nations General Assembly had voted for on Israel uh, a short a, a few days ago, um, is one that they will have to debate and one that will have to take serious consideration. But more importantly, the judgments coming out of the International Court of Justice, an organ of the United, uh, the United Nations, is one that President Ramaphosa feels like has not been given enough attention, at least he's remarked about that previously. Does that short statement, unjust, unfair and unsustainable, other words you use there, speak to that context. 
Very much so. I mean, I think what you have at the United Nations, you refer to the General Assembly resolution that basically sought to affirm a, a July uh, International Court of Justice advisory opinion that said Israel's continued occupation of the occupied Palestinian territories was unlawful and that they should withdraw and basically called on the other organs of the United Nations. Remember, the ICJ is the judicial organ. You then have the General Assembly, you have the Trusteeship Council, the Economic and Social Council, and the Security Council. Council, and they called specifically on the GA and the UN Security Council to effect this decision. And what the General Assembly, uh, um, I think it was earlier this week, uh, decided was that uh, Israel's occupation should end within 12 months. The big question is essentially th that goes to the question you're asking me is whether this will actually happen or not. And this is what President Ramaphosa is talking about, the fact that we take decisions in these august assemblies, in the Security Council, and often, even whether it's legally binding or not, these decisions do not uh, get implemented. And that, I think, is a big question that the pact of the future, the digital compact and this declaration for future generations is seeking to undergird, to support and to change the calculus moving forward. The big question, though, is, as I keep pointing out there, you know, let me use one example. In 2018, there was something called the Man Nelson Mandela Peace Summit. Uh, they uh, inaugurated, was inaugurated by President Ramaphosa. And this was kind of the vision for how the uh, how UN member states were going to work to achieve peace and security and a more equitable and fairer world. Has that uh, um, document, which was also a voluntary consensus-driven document being yeah. implemented, I would argue it's not. And so you have a similar, similarly adopted pact, pact of the future that the Secretary General says is the how in, in how we uh, do better. The question is, will member states meet the moment? That is an open question for now. Just lastly, on tonality and the word of choices there in President Ramaphosa's speech can be quite telling, and uh, some of these words reverberate throughout the chambers. The wound of inequality cuts deep, exacerbating, exacerbating poverty, unemployment, deprivation, and destitution. These challenges transcend borders, they affect everyone. These words will ring hollow if inequality, global inequality, especially in the global south, is not addressed sufficiently. Taking a look at what the agenda of, or at least programmatically, what's on the agenda of the future of the summit over the next couple of days, uh, is there enough emphasis placed on conversations pertaining to very specifically global inequality? There is a document called the Sustainable Development Goals with 17 goals and over 100 targets that deal with issues of no poverty by 2030, uh, no food insecurity, by, by no hunger by 2030, uh, gender equality and women's empowerment will be achieved by 2030, uh, good health, quality health and well-being, uh, and the list of clean water and sanitation, strong institutions and governance, life above and below uh, the water. And so these are very specific goals and targets that are not being implemented by member states. And so what the president is referring to there is the financing that is required to meet these goals. When you, when you talk about addressing poverty, when you talk about mitigating climate change, there's, some, there's a principle called common but differentiated responsibilities that says those that created the problem of uh, the level of greenhouse gases we're seeing in the atmosphere that is affecting the climate change that we are experiencing in South Africa with the icy cold weather you're seeing uh, right now, uh, that needs money to make the transition to renewables. And the concern from developing countries, a long-standing concern, is that developed countries that are most responsible for uh, the effects of climate change that we are seeing and its impacts have not met the moment. Uh, a fin international financial development institutions like the World Bank and the IMF and the like are not meeting the moment in terms of how developing countries in particular, small island states most notably, require the financing to be able to make the transitions to meet the 17 sustainable development goals among those climate action. And so money is very important in this conversation. And so if you don't have the money, what you have on paper it looks really great in theory, but implementation takes money. It takes billions and billions and trillions of dollars yeah. over a, a, a number of years to meet the, the 2030 uh, deadline. But of course, uh, as the numbers tell us, the, we are not going to make that deadline by 2030. That's the big concern now. Sure, and Bryce, please thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. SBC News correspondent coming to us live from New York.